Hi, my name is Dr. Vincent Wargo. I'm an instructor at the uh, University of St. Francis. And I wanted to present these, uh, some ideas tonight uh, that occurred to me in the middle of teaching a class on social political philosophy. I'm not an expert in social political philosophy, but uh, during the time we were teaching th this class, the questions about freedom were coming up. And so, um, I was always interested, you know, a lot of de debates, we like to cash out a lot of values in terms of just one. So in some cases, money seems to be the only value that is determinative of what we should do or not do, right? Uh, in the political order, it looked like liberty was the ultimate value among all political values that get cashed out. So thinking about that, I, I started to teach this course and I, I ran into three thinkers, John Stuart Mill on liberty, uh, Isaiah Berlin on uh, two concepts of liberty, and on uh, and, um, uh, Charles Taylor uh, article on, on positive and negative liberty. And I saw some connections here that I, I thought there was a good debate running through these thinkers that expressed this question about is there only one political value, liberty or not? And what are the consequences of that? Okay, so my paper, t so my, my presentation tonight is about political values as such. Okay, so I want to start with, uh, I have two questions. The first question is, should the purpose of government be to promote what is good, moral, or defend personal liberty, right? This is, this is a basic question. So let's start with John Stuart Mill. So I'll give you some things about John Stuart Mill. Mill thought that the goal of the state should be to pr protect individual li liberties. He assumed that the liberty is the highest value among all the political goods, all right? The only, he quotes, Quote, the only purpose for which power and authority is rightfully exercised over any member of society is to prevent him from doing harm to others. His own good, whether physically, morally, or otherwise, cannot be sufficient warrant for the exercise of authority. Looking at this, I would have to say that there is a struggle for, for Mill about is there ever the possibility of legitimate authority? Which, can, which means, in, in a sense, is there ever the possibility of law being authoritative? Okay? So, Mill's idea about personal liberty takes on what we would consider basic liberties now, right? And so it's the liberty of inward consciousness, the liberty of tastes and pursuits, that is, action and publication, and the freedom to unite with others for, the, for whatever purpose, so freedom of meeting. These are all considered by us now to be relatively normal liberties that one would enjoy. Okay? Now, to understand, I think, some of Mill's argument, you have to know what he assumed or what he thought was the case. The first thing that Mill assumed was that the individual is the unit of society, right? That is, that is that there are no subsidiary groups between the individual and the state, okay? So that the encroachment of the state can always be coercive and totalitarian, totalitarian in some regards, okay? So, for, for Mill, and I, th I think he comes out of the English tradition, I think he would uphold to, uh, that civil life is not essentially from our nature. We're not, we are not by nature uh, inclined to live together. We are only brought together through a contract, through some artificial device, right? This is important, right? So Hobbes, we know, said that the state of nature, Thomas Hobbes, is perpetual war. That is, Morality and law only come through when the, when the social contract is made. So 
prior to the state, there is no morality and there's no rights. Okay? John Locke amended Hobbes' position and claimed that there are natural rights prior to the contract, the suppression of which, he claimed, would allow individuals to reject the social contract. Okay? So in this case, laws are external forces that act on the natural intentions of people. There will, they will, by nature, be coercive for Mill, for Locke, and for um, um, Hobbes. Okay? But, but probably closer to, to Mill is probably the Enlightenment that, that claimed that laws are nothing more than the will of the people. Or the, expression, or the expression of traditional attitudes or customs. In both cases, laws are only relative to a particular society and are in opposition to personal freedoms and interests. They are essentially, like I said before, external constraints to action. They are what Mill, ca Mill calls the tyranny of the majority. So on this basis, the assertion of personal liberties as a right is is a protective stance against a state and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a political system where laws are coercive by nature and external. That is, they're coercive in us to stop actions. Okay. So, so Mill in general considers that the majority of, of opinions concerning what is or is not correct behavior or moral to be evidence that there should be a limit to, to the expression of moral, moral laws. The only thing that he would allow really was do no harm. Right? That's the only moral constraint that he thinks is universally binding as such on all persons. So as a utilitarian, right, Mill's act, so Mill thought actions are not good or bad in themselves, but are only, <laughs> but are only so-called based on their effects, right? So lying and murder are not essentially wrong, but the effects that these these things have. The morality of these acts depend on how the majority of people feel about them and the consequences, whether these consequences are are pleasing or not, right? So this is the, some of the background to Mill's idea of, of liberty. So. The next question should be, can there be a right to liberty? Can liberty be a right? And I think it's a very interesting question because it asks us to think about what is a right, right? So for Locke, there were inalienable natural rights, right? But I think this is pro the, the, the whole idea of natural rights is problematic. Because in most cases, what we mean by a right is uh, we think of something in terms of if you have a right, then I have an obligation to fulfill your right. Right? So rights stand in relation to obligations. That makes sense. Right? So to assert a natural right, okay, we understand that as don't uh, interfere in somebody else's pursuit of liberty, right? But it's a very interesting thing. When someone has a right to something, like I said, you and I are obliged out of justice to render them that right. It presupposes political community. That is, a natural relation to each other. So the right to liberty, the, the, the right to non-interference, -inter is paradoxical in one sense. In the sense that Mill is asking for us uh, not so much a right for liberty. So what Mill's asking for us is, on the basis of our community, don't be involved with me. Is there, you can think of the right to, right, liberty rights in that way, right? So it's a very interesting kind of different way to couch what is a, a natural right in the terms of a liberty right, right? Uh, in general, 
liberty, we distinguish um, liberty rights from positive rights. Liberty rights are things that you can't interfere with somebody pursuing. Positive rights usually are things that you are obliged to furnish. So if, if children have a right to a basic education, then I have an obligation to pay my taxes as such. So the question of is there a natural right to liberty is an interesting thing politically in how it will be enforced. That's all I'm saying. More likely than a right, I think what Mill is thinking about is privilege. That is, that I have the privilege to withdraw from society if I so wish to. Okay, that's, that's the point I want to make. Now Mill's defense of personal, and the reason why I say that is because Mill's defense of personal liberty springs from a post-romantic idea that each person uh, is allowed to form the realization uh, of their own original identity. So the realization of everybody is uniquely his or her own. Okay? In this sense, Mill thinks about privilege as, that is, the, the liberty rights, as a kind of privilege or cultivation of individuality. And that was a big theme in the latter part of the 19th century, especially around wealthy, wealthy, well-off gentlemen. Right? So this right is about a right, or is, is maybe more about a notion of privilege, right? The, the privilege to withdraw. So actually, as a privilege, it makes sense because only people who are who have wealth and leisure can really withdraw from society in terms of liberty rights. So what I think is odd about liberty rights now is how they've morphed into the 21st century is we actually have big or government defending our rights. Right? But for, for Mill, the idea of a liberty right was this idea of a zone of non-interference by the government. That is, a protection of privacy. Right? But now, the way we, I think we understand it now is liberty rights are protected by the government. Whereas he originally thought they were the limit by which the government could proceed no further. So it's a very interesting outcome, I think, from what, how he originally thought it was going to be. Now, I want to play this off to show you that some of these ideas can have counterparts. That is, you can think of these problems a little differently. So these are, these are some of the things that you can look at. So we'll go next to Aristotle. Now I bring Aristotle up because Aristotle and his notion of freedom, the classical medieval notion of freedom, is a lot different than freedom as, as uh, non-interference. Right? But he can only say, uh, he, can only, he can only give his account if we really change what the playing field looks like. So for Aristotle, he says the goal of the state is to make people virtuous and to promote the common good, wherein happiness of both the individual state could be achieved. Okay? This essentially means that, that maybe liberty rights are not the highest, the highest value, political value. Right? And why he can make this case. Now, Aristotle, in opposition to um, I've got some things that Aristotle. So some things that Aristotle assumed. Aristotle first assumed that human beings are by nature political animals, zuon politikon, right? There is a natural tendency of human beings to want to live together. And this natural tendency is part of their essence. That is, they essentially, we essentially live in groups. We don't essentially, we are not essentially individuals in the first case. 
Okay, and I think that's a, that's a big change. In such a way that for Aristotle, the polis, the city, would have a natural gravitation to pull people together. That is, people are pulled to living together. The polis has that gravitation to pull us into living in society. Right? So, it's in our nature to want to live together. It's in our nature to want to get along. This is in complete opposition to the British empiricists who would have claimed, no, the, the beginning of society is the individual, and really, society can only come, back, come about through artificial means. All right? Those points are fundamentally different. So you get two different str strange conceptions of what, what government is and what law is and, uh, as such. So, for Aristotle, morality, which is part of happiness, takes the form, I say, of civic virtues. That is, <clears throat> prudence, justice, courage, and even temperance, generosity, these are all perfecting the individual, but really they perfect the individual in relation to living with other people. Courage is about being willing to risk one's life for a good that's more important than one's personal existence. Justice is about rendering the other their due, right? So, but that, that sense of justice both perfects the person who, who is owed the due and the one who pays it, right? So in this way, it looks like a very different thing, whereas, Hume would have, whereas Mill would have said, laws look essentially coercive. Laws are essentially external. For Aristotle and the tradition that follows him, laws are going to be something different. Laws are going to be based on the morality of virtue, and they are going to support the virtuous interactions of human beings, their relationships. Okay? So, so, in addition to the virtues and justice, Aristotle thought that political life depends on friendships. Friendships between people that, and, that are maybe not members of the same family, or, but a concern for each other and in their concern for the common good. Okay? So that what builds up a state is not in the first case the instantiation of, pers of individuals with personal rights, but with morality as virtuous action, the, cult the, the cultivation of virtue, and political friendship. Okay? So, how does this, how does this, what is, how does this cash out for Aristotle? He says, the society or the polis is where human beings, where the human potential becomes fully realized. That is, we really do thrive in relation to each other and in, the, and in political community. Right? Laws, he says, are based on reason and the concern for the common good. Right? And the common good are those goods which are common to everyone. Right? So the common good is opposed, of course, to any notion of private good or private interest. Right? In this case, if laws are essentially supposed to be rational and concerned for the common good, then we have, in a sense, a principal criterion for authority. Right? And what I said in the first slide was, Mill thought it was problematic any form of authority in relation to, hu to human liberty. So what he's saying is any form of political state would be, the authority of the political state is always suspect by nature. There could never be, at best, a, 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 a correct political authority. What the ancients have come up with, and let me give you this definition of law. So, Following on, on Aristotle, uh, Thomas Aquinas defined the essence of laws as an ordinance of reason for the common good by one competent to make it and promulgate it. That is, both enacted, enforced, and made known. 
when laws are reasonable or when they don't protect the common, so when they are unreasonable or when they don't protect the common good, they are, or when they're not made by somebody in real authority to make these laws, they are not laws. Okay? And this is in, I would say this idea of law versus will of the people, there's a profound difference to how we think about these two things. So when you think about Mill and liberty, realize that the world that he's talking about, the political reality he's talking about, is a political reality of the 19th century, not, a cl not the classical reality of, or classical philosophy of, of the ancients. And this means that he's going to see things and, 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 and conclude certain, with certain ideas that, uh, that are gerund only if those assumptions are correct that he makes. Okay? So it's up to you, I think, to, to decide you know, how you want to think about what is a human being, how you want to think about what is political community, and how you want to think about what is law. And if you can de decide of those things, that's the first, I think, really hurdle that you have to meet. Okay. Now the second question, I said there are two questions that, kind of, that I wanted to talk about, was what form of liberty should be legislated by the state? So we're leaving the question of what is the, you know, what is the highest value of the state, right? To defend personal liberty or to make people moral. But this basic question in the first question doesn't go away when we think about what is the form of liberty that should be legislated by the state. So I want to bring you to the next two people that we're going to talk about. And the first one is Isaiah Berlin. In his essay on the two concepts of liberty, he suggests that there are two forms of political liberty, positive liberty and negative liberty. And he says this of negative liberty. Negative liberty is freedom from outside control of the government or persons that would seek to limit our liberty. I would conclude that this is in line pretty much with Mill's idea of liberty. Further, he says it's the lack, he says the lack of negative freedom is due to coercion and not simply inability. So he says poverty is not going to affect my negative liberty, right? Only if, that is an inability to get myself out of debt, only if there is some mechanism in place that's there that's suppressing me. Okay? So the question about negative liberty, no coercion, no outside influence, is it, it becomes a question of simply what I would say um, <clears throat> control. Right? Uh, your inability to achieve certain things is not uh, going to be a lack of your negative, negative freedom. Right? So negative liberty sees the lack of freedom in terms of what he calls the exclusions of the possibility to act. So for example, the classic example would be a prisoner in jail would be, uh, would be an example of how society limits the freedom by creating rules that limit my possibility to act. Right? So Berlin makes three points about negative liberty. First, he says, Mill was incorrect to claim that all coercion, insofar as it frustrates human desire, is bad. As it may also prevent, so he says, some greater evil. Mill was also wrong, he says, to consider uh, non-interference, i.e. the opposite of coercion, to be good. Right? In addition, Mill was wrong to think that, that human beings only discover truth or develop a certain type of character, a kind of individuality that is critical, imaginative, non-conforming, uh, to the point of ex 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 being eccentric, only on the condition that there is complete freedom of personal expression and freedom to do whatever one wants. Again, Mill's point is, I have the freedom to destroy myself. That's what we're talking about. I have the freedom to say whatever I want. So Mill would not be against white supremacists 
having Facebook accounts, right? It was recently about a teacher that had a, uh, was a white supremacist, right? That's a form of personal liberty, right? Mill may not, you know, uh, Mill, you could say we could push Mill even further. Mill would not, would maybe side with those people that the Me Too group is attacking because they're coercing them through public opinion. You don't have that right. Okay? So wait a minute. There's some questions about what Mill thinks or how we feel about this idea of liberty, absolute personal liberty. Does it come with certain responsibilities? And if it comes with certain responsibilities, then morality has a part to play. Right. So he says, furthermore, some other things you should know. He says, the concept of negative liberty, this is this idea of personal liberty, he says is itself new. It didn't exist in the ancient world that we know about. It didn't exist in the Orient. He says it's a product of the Renaissance. It's, it's, it's about 400 years old right now. Right? And lastly, his, his critique of negative freedom is uh, it's not synonymous with democracy. He says we can imagine states where negative freedom, where people have a lot of negative freedom, that is, there's no coercion to act, but these people can be, these states can be ruled by a despot who has no concern for his, for his people. Okay? So that's what he says about, that's his critique of, of, negative, of negative freedom. Positive freedom is another form of liberty. Positive freedom, he says, the causes of, so what is, he goes, the causes of, of unfreedom in the, comes about, he says, in positive freedom, I've got to say this, term, positive freedom is the ability to do what you want to do, right? And when you are somehow unable to do what you want to do, then there is a problem, you're unfree. So the causes of unfreedom with regards to positive freedom is when the agent or the, per, in the agent or the person themselves they could be psychological forms of ignorance, irrationality, delusion, or obsession. So he says the state seeks to help people become rational, educated, and self-controlled. This is Aristotle's position. So there has to be a liberty. Is there a liberty? Is, is liberty positive? That is, liberty is the ability to be something, to be a certain way. And to be a certain way means to, to ultimately to be what we think is the, the moral rectitude of the, of, of the, of the society, right? So that's, that's what the question revolves around, right? So an unfree person with reg would be somebody who lacks self-control in their inner lives so they cannot act freely since what they do is not completely voluntary, right? So an example would be an addict. Uh, anyone who has any, uh, an addict is, is someone who does not act out of freedom, but under the compulsion of his own or her own addiction. Okay, does this make sense? Okay. So what, he, what, what Ber, Berlin says about positive freedom in terms of critiquing it is a couple points. He says, Proponents of positive freedom must argue that their anonymous, or sorry, their autonomous true self versus a heteronymous apparent self. So that is, the autonomous true self is the one that is self-legislating, right? A heteronymous self is one who is, who is legislated by their own desires as such, right? So the true self seeks, seeks a freedom as self-mastery, while the apparent self is enslaved by their irrational impulses and the pursuits of immediate pleasures. While Berlin accepts that there are many occasions, so Berlin accepts that there are many occasions where coercion can and should be used to pursue freedom and equality, that is, coercion that is to limit personal freedom, right? Uh, and there are all kinds of cases, you know, now that we can think of in terms of this. He says it's, it's a dangerous form. It can be dangerous because it assumes we know what's best for people. 
So any state that wants to talk about morality and emphasize making persons good are going to assume that they know what it is to be moral. And is that an overassumption? And so finally, uh, Berlin cautions us that the doctrine of positive freedom in its extreme can take the forms of a retreat. So if you say that real freedom is nothing but self-mastery, he says, it, in a place where, and you let go of the, the whole idea of negative liberty or negative freedom, that is non-interference, what positive freedom looks like as self-mastery is, in the end, a kind of Buddhist sage. You know, that you are going to control your desire. That at the end of this kind of freedom looks like just the controlled desire and not really political liberty in any, any sense that we in the West would know it. Right? So, how do we balance positive liberty, which is trying to be a self mastery, which presupposes a kind of moral basis, with negative liberty as non interference? the ability to act freely without coercion. That's the, that's the jumble for, for Berlin. And Berlin tries to solve this problem in a kind of... Uh, Berlin's judgment uh, is that it's, it's based on political expediency. So he doesn't think that negative liberty is any better than positive liberty, but he sees that the institution, he says, of positive liberties by society is more problematic, he says, to enforce them. Bill, so Berlin questions the very idea that there exists some ideal form in which positive and negative freedoms can be brought together in some harmony. That is, we in the West keep thinking that if we get it right with our political institutions, will balance morality and law with personal freedoms. Berlin s suggests that maybe these are two diametrically opposed forces that can never brought, be brought into the harmony. That is, one is the yin to the other's yang. Okay? But this I itself is no less a metaphysical assumption than than to think that we can harmonize these two things, right? So, for Berlin, this idea of a pragmatic approach that will be based less on political ideas and what can be effectively legislated and, and enforced. Uh, so he says, positive is liberty is dangerous because it makes the distinction between a person's apparent and true self the apparent self is made up of those drives and emotions that society deems unhealthy. And once this distinction is draw, drawn, the individual must suppress the apparent self for the true self. Right? And again, the drug addict does not truly, we would say the drug addict does not truly want or need the drugs they are addicted to, so the laws are passed to make drug use illegal. In the sense, in the hope that we actually make the addict freer. Right? That's the argument for positive liberty. Berlin's concern is how will the society or state determine what is the real or true self? By what measure can we do that? Right? That's, that itself is problematic if you don't think that human beings have an essential nature. Right? John, John Paul Sartre said, we are free to create ourselves because we have no nature. Well, how does that play forth in a political domain? Right? Is that, is that enough to constitute a society? So that's one question. So my last person I wanted to talk about is Charles Taylor. Strangely enough, he was a student of Isaiah Berlin. And so in his, his essay, What's Wrong with Negative Liberty, it takes issue with his former teacher's conclusion. Right? So again, Taylor also wants to get away from identifying positive 
uh, and negative freedom in terms of political orientations as liberal or conservative. And that's true because what happens is, depending on the question that's at play, conservatives can be very uh, wanting a lot of liberty. Uh, uh, and on other situations, liberals are, are demanding liberty rights. So it depends on what the issue is, it seems, it seems to be the case. So he argues, so Taylor argues that, that although Berlin's defense of negative freedom was eloquent in trying to define the terms of a space of non-interference and the positive freedom as a question of, but he says it tries to define negative liberty as a space of non-interference and positive freedom as who or what controls. So the end of Berlin's assumption is it's problematic, positive, positive liberty is problematic because who actually determines it. Okay? So he wants to investigate the problem from a different angle. So for, for, for Charles Taylor, he says that negative liberty is an internally unstable, con is an internally unstable con uh, concept. The chief virtue, he says, of negative liberty is its simplicity, being simply free from outside influences. One does not try to argue the nature of freedom as anything more substantial as this. Would so if one were try to, to, to argue the nature of freedom as anything more substantial than this, you would have to use values, right? Or some common good of the people, right? nor does it concern itself with any internal force that blocks our freedom. So what's going for negative liberty, again, is its simplicity. Negative liberty is, the, is only what he considers an opportunity concept rather than an exercise concept. And what he means by this is opportunity concepts mean that no one need actually use the liberties which they choose. Instead, liberty increases with the number of options available for an individual and decreases with the number of options available. Right? So again, negative liberty as an opportunity concept doesn't really talk about the actuality of, of any liberty, but the possibility of it. This is a rephrasing, a slight rephrasing of the problem. Positive liberty, he says, are about specific liberties, not just the absence of obstacles, but the presence, he says, of internal capacities. Right? Here, liberty is not about the quantity of possible actions that someone is able to perform, but the quality of the actions they are actually inclined and disposed to perform. So what are you actually wanting to do? So in the end, he says, positive liberty can only, access, can only assess an individual's degree of freedom by examining the individual's inner workings, that is, their motives, with reference to some conception of, of what it is to be a human being, that is, what are the proper aims and ends of a rational, uh, of a rational being. This is opposed, he says, to negative liberty, where one can be as irrational or self-destructive as one likes. Right? So, for example, the state secures their citizens' liberty without taking a stand on how the individuals exercise their liberty. That's, an, again, an example of negative liberty. So he says, if you like negative liberty, or if you value negative liberty over positive liberty, then he says, that is the sheer lack of coercive rules that regulate your life. He says, I'll give you an example. He says, he says, let's compare Albania and England. What country, he says, does a better job of promoting liberty of, for its citizens? He says, so he says, for example, in Albania, there are fewer traffic regulations and stoplights compared with England. He says, however, Albania does not allow the public demonstration of religion, whereas in England, such demonstrations are legal and encouraged. Now, according to Berlin's analysis of negative liberty, Albania would be a freer and, and more liberating securing state than England. 
since on the everyday perspective, one encounters less traffic lights and regulations than one would in England. Right? However, the open practice of religion is a higher good, relating more to the essential aspect of being human than does freedom from daily traffic controls. So quantitatively, Al Albania is freer than England. Therefore, we would say, if you, if you don't assume the quantitative but the qualitative, then, then therefore England does a better job at protecting the liberties than Albania. And this corresponds with most people's view of these two countries. So if, we, if most people assume that England is, is more free or protecting of personal liberties in Albania, then he says, we got to rethink this. And his point is just simple, and it's, I'll be done in just two minutes. Taylor's point is that, there are, that it's important for both negative and positive freedom depends, he says, it's important to understand negative positive freedom, that it depends on background practices. That we all, and that these practices, these background practices, are what are how we discriminate between values. He says, human beings, Taylor argues, are not only subject to first order desires, that is the desire f for their things, we are also subject, he says, to second order desire, desires about our desires. So we experience our own as desires at, and purposes as qualitatively discriminative, either as higher or lower, noble or base. Uh, so he says, for a sense of freedom that is tied with this, this would be a positive liberty, or positive freedom, rather than negative liberty. And he tries to give you some examples of why this is. And this, I'll just give you the examples, and I'm done. He goes, he says, isn't it normal, Taylor argues, that our evaluations of our desires would have consequences for our sense of freedom? So how we, how we evaluate our desires really are an indication of how free we think we are. He says, example, if a person's spiteful feelings and violent reactions, which they had trouble inhibiting, were undermining all their important relationships, or if a person had a fear of public speaking uh, uh, that would destroy his possible or her possible career in politics or in, in entertainment. He says, in these cases, one would easily forgo these internal obstacles, spiteful feelings and fear, and still consider oneself to be oneself. Right? So what he's saying is, if you would, if I told you, you are not, no longer allowed to be spiteful, or you shouldn't be spiteful and be violent in your reactions to your loved ones, that's not really a limitation of your freedom. Because it's actually, incur it's, you still identify yourself as yourself with the higher value that you preferred, maintaining that relationship. Or the inability to speak in public is not really a limitation on your losing that fear or getting rid of that fear is not a limitation on your freedom because you would a higher value would be to follow your desire to become a, a politician or an entertainer right so he says he says but what about this case what about the case where a marriage is falling apart because uh, the, the husband is going to the pub several times a week with the boys. Here, unlike the other cases, right, I feel less free because somehow my identity is tied up with going to the pub and having some beer with the boys, Taylor says, right? Whereas in the other cases, my identity was not tied up with that, and so I didn't feel less free giving those things up. So he says, if you agree with that analysis, then you agree that positive liberty is more important. And that's, that's the end of my presentation. So. <clears throat> I have to say, if I could have you guys in my class, it would be great. So if you want to show up. <laughs>
at USF, that would be 